is there. Yeah. And indeed, where can we go where Christ is not there? Yeah, sure because he is the Savior, and he is sitting on the right hand of God. And being a deity, he can be everywhere. And I'm convinced that he's here today. Yeah. Where two or three are gathered in my name, the Bible says, there I am in the midst thereof also. And we have more than two or three gathered here this morning. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see all you who, who have come out for the morning worship service today. And I appreciate uh, the fact that they've allowed me to come and speak for a few moments for you. Few moments. <laughs> but it seems I'm going to have five minutes for that time. And the teacher that I am. I, I, uh, I can't help but thinking that, you know, after a baptism, you know, at a, at a congregation, everything else you do is going to be going downhill. And the baptism is the greatest thing that can ever be accomplished in a single service. And now it's my task, but to we grab this, this service and get it back again before I lost it. And like a baseball player, uh -uh. when you have when you have a pitcher who's an ace pitcher who can strike up everybody on the side, yeah. but before he gets out of the pitch, a guy on his team hits a home run or a grand slam, and then the pitcher has to work hard now to try to grab back the moment and the impetus. That's how I feel right now. Yeah. But nevertheless, I will try to prevail here today. Yeah, right. we, certainly, we certainly be happy to have a new Christian this year and congratulate her later on uh, today after the service. Yeah. Yeah. The, the angels of heaven rejoice when yeah. one soul you know, repents of sin and comes to the Lord. Yeah. So we're we'll very happy about that today. We have some visitors in the audience today. We have some who are visiting from other churches, some from other congregations, and some just kind of walk in, happen to uh, be in the community and came in to, to be with us today and to worship with us. Amen. We appreciate having you here. I want you to know that the things that we say and that we teach from the pulpit are designed so that we can all get a better understanding of what the Lord requires of us. Right. These things that we say are not designed to hurt anyone or designed to offend anyone or to put anyone off because we certainly don't want to do that. We want you to join with us and be part of us. And we want to unify the world under the same banner of Christ Amen. and follow the Bible, the written word. And there are a lot of people who believe in the Lord Jesus. Yeah. And some of them uh, come from different backgrounds and different groups. And if you come from those groups, we appreciate you. And we, we, and we uh, enjoy having you with us today. But we implore you to please study with us and work with it and hear what we're saying. We mean it fervently. And we mean it sincerely. Amen. We want everyone to be pleasing and acceptable to God. Amen. And to follow God's Amen. word. Yeah. If I can just uh, start, I want to just say something about myself, for those who don't know. After many years of teaching in the public schools, the Lord blessed me to be able to earn my law degree and get licensed to practice law in the state of California. And I really appreciate that. And I'm now a lawyer, and I, I'm able to practice law, do certain things, which I hope for, for the good of those that I come in contact with. And I see some of you already cringing. <laughs> lawyer, lawyer. Don't cringe, don't cringe. It won't be that bad. I don't want to be a lawyer like the one in the story. But there was a story about uh, some men who were on a plane. There was, there was a doctor, a lawyer, there was a preacher, and there was a boy on the plane. It was a small plane, okay? And uh, there was a, the, the pilot was, was, was flying the plane. And as they went along the way, the plane began to have some trouble. There was some turmoil. The engine started, started sputtering. And, and the pilot yelled back in, there to them, oh, I got bad news for you. We're going we're gonna to be going down pretty soon. But he said, don't worry. There are some parachutes there in the back where you all are. Now, me, I'm the pilot. I'm going to stay on this plane, and, and I'm going to stay with the plane all the way to the end and maybe crash it into the, in the water or somewhere perhaps. But you all, there's, there's, there are three parachutes back there. So discuss among yourselves who get the parachutes and do what you will. Well, you can imagine, there are four of them. A doctor, a lawyer, a preacher, and a boy. Right. So they're back there discussing it. And the doctor got up and said, I'm a doctor. I save lives. I have gifted hands. 
The world needs me. The world cannot do without me. Therefore, I'm going to take this parachute and I'm going right now. He got the parachute, he jumps out and he's gone. Okay? And then next, we have, uh, we have a lawyer. And the lawyer said, look here, I'm a lawyer. Okay? I, I have defended people all over the world. I, I prosecuted people. I got millions of dollars for my clients. I, you know, I'm smart. I'm intellectual. I'm so smart that really, it would be a shame if I was not in this world. The world needs me because of my intellect, yeah. because of what I bring to the table, because of my, my abilities and, and my intelligence. So you know what? I'm going to take that parachute and I'm gone. He grabbed the, he grabbed the parachute and he, he heads out. Okay? The preacher says to the boy, young man, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I've been preaching a long time, and I don't mind if I have to end my life this way, because I'm ready. I'm ready to go. You, you're young. You got your whole life ahead of you. And so I'll tell you right now, that last parachute right there, son, you go ahead and take that parachute. You go ahead and take it and jump out to your freedom. And don't worry about me. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. The boy looked at the preacher and said, Brother Preacher, I think we're both going to be all right. He said, because you see, the smartest man in the world just jumped out of this plane with my backpack. There's still two more packs here. And you're not going to be all right. So I don't want to be like, I don't want to be like that lawyer. I'm a lawyer, but not like that lawyer. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. The smart man in the world. Backpack. And boy, he did fly. <laughs> you know, in the news today, we hear a lot about people who are talking about religion, going back and forth about what religion is. And to my, uh, my surprise, even in the, 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 the recent presidential campaign, there was some talk about religion. Those of you who have been listening to following the news, you may know that there was a feud that was going on between Donald Trump and Pope Francis. A feud. Pope Francis told Donald Trump, you're not Christian. Can you believe that? I, I, I saw that. I love that when I saw that. Now, Donald Trump, you know, I, I could probably criticize a number of things about Donald Trump. Not being a Christian would not be my first thing I would think of. But, but the Pope of the Catholic Church said, you're not Christian. And Donald Trump, he, he took offense to that. He said, "Our radius, it, it, it was a shame to have someone question his faith and so on and so forth. But I began to think about that. A Christian, what is a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Did you not know that 32% of the people in the Western world claim to be Christian? Well, actually, in the whole world. 32%. And in this country, 70% of the people in the United States of America claim to be Christian. And seven out of every 10 people claim to be Christian. <clears throat> Boy, how the times have changed. You see, there was a time when it was not popular to claim Christianity. Look in the first century, not so popular. But now, surprisingly, it's all turned around. It's politically correct to be a Christian in many circles. And there are millions of people, I said millions of people, claiming to be a Christian today. In the USA, in this country, there are 217 different denominations who claim Christianity. They all consider themselves part of the Christian faith. Not to mention all the Catholics in the country, millions and millions of Catholics. There are dozens of versions of Baptists, several types of Methodists. We have Lutherans, we have Mormons, Pentecostals, Episcopalians, Wesleyans, Scientologists, uh, uh, Church of God in Christ. Uh, you know, we go on and on and on with all these. And then even the Church of Christ, the group that many of us are part of, even the Church of Christ has splinter groups. Splinter groups. Now look, let's turn this topic a little closer in the hole. What about you? What about you? Are you a Christian? I mean, why are there so many different groups of people claiming to be Christians today? And why are they all doing different things? Is that what Jesus wanted? No. He wanted to have people unified and under his one banner and of his church. Let's take a look at that. If you're claiming to be a Christian today, 
I'm gonna say to you the same thing that the eighth grader told his classmate. Prove it. <laughs> right, prove it. You're a Christian, you prove it. That's why. Right. Can you prove that you're a Christian? Think about that. Can you prove that you are a Christian? I know you're probably thinking, yes, I can prove it. But what if you had to prove it, church? What if you were on trial and your freedom or your existence depended on whether or not you could prove that you were a Christian? The topic of my discourse today is a Christian on trial. A Christian on trial. So I want each one of you to pretend that you are a defendant who must prove that he or she really is a Christian today. That's right. And, and I, as, a, as a, a licensed attorney, I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to take a little unconventional approach today. I'm going to use my lawyering skills today to put you on trial. Oh, I had a brother bring a chair up here on the stage. See, this is your chair. <laughs> the witness chair right here. And though I want you to imagine that you are the person in this chair being questioned with the question that I'm going to ask today. All right. And I want to see if you can, can substantiate whether or not you are a Christian today. All right. All right. You know, I may be helping you to get a better realization of yourself. Or I may be exposing you for what you are. But nevertheless, I'm going to put a Christian on trial today. Right. My message is not designed, it's not designed to hurt or harm, but to motivate and to encourage us to look inward, to look at ourselves. Amen. Okay? So can you work with me for a little bit? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, in a court of law, we have rules. Okay? Uh, and, and judges will be the ones to make sure the rules are carried out. Yes, and sometimes judges will be the ones who will be the trier of fact. They'll make the, the final decision. Sometimes we'll be a jury. It depends on what kind of case it is. But always, always, the rulings are based upon the evidence. Right. The evidence. And the evidence can be presented in several different ways. It can be direct evidence. For example, a document. Uh, it can be a picture. It can be a video. Or it can be circumstantial evidence. We look at the facts surrounding uh, what, what happened. And you, you, you're drawn to a certain conclusion. Fingerprints, a door left open, ashes on the floor, circumstantial evidence. Or the evidence can be a personal witness testimony. Or an expert witness testimony. These are all ways which we can establish uh, whether something is true or not and get to, and get to the, the, the truth of the matter. That's evidence. So look, my question is, what evidence do you have that you are a Christian today? I'm going to put a Christian on trial today. So uh, if I bring up a defendant, uh, I'll have the person sit right here, sit in the chair, and I'll ask the person a few questions. Imagine that you were the person answering those questions. So my first defendant claims to be a Christian, okay? And he says that he does not believe in organized religions. <clears throat> claims to be a Christian, but does not believe in organized religions. He calls himself a believer. He says, Christians put too much stock in the Bible. And the Bible's outdated. But his words, not mine. He says that he feels there's too, there's too much regulation. I will then ask the person, so what do you want to do as a Christian? His answer probably is, I want to do my own thing. I want to do my own thing, okay? Let's establish some preliminary facts first. My first question to this defendant is, what do you believe? Mm -hmm. so according to the scripture, our identity must be based upon our belief. Because Jesus, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, right. will you would die in your sins. Right. Okay? And then the writer of the book of Hebrews says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. Mm -hmm. But he that comes to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Yeah. So what you believe today? Right. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? That he is the Christ, mm -hmm. the Son of God? Matthew 16, verse 16. Also Mark 1 and verse 1. Do you believe in God himself? Do you believe that God is the creator of the world and the universe? As the Bible says in Genesis 1 and verse 1, Isaiah 40 and 28, and don't you know that it's he that hath made us Amen. and not we ourselves? That's right. Psalm 100 verse 3. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that it, the Holy Spirit, is our guide and our teacher? Look in John 16 chapter verse 13. How be it when he the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. Yes. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. 
and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit, you believe in the Holy Spirit today. Amen. I was going to ask this defendant, do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe that it is a written word of God? 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, it was written and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Bible writers and prophets were inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, verse 21. Yeah. Now, if his answers to these questions are yes, then we can begin. Mm -hmm. If his answers to these questions are no, we, all, we need to go no further. Uh, I have another sermon for him, but that will be for a different day. <laughs> but if he answers yes, though, we go a little further. Now, Mr. Christian, you testified that you did not believe in organized religions. What do you mean by organized religions? Mm -hmm. But who would probably say uh, that he's against going to church and he's against <laughs> attending worship services? He'll probably say that he's against ministers, and elders, and deacons, and church officials. Okay? Is that your testimony? Okay. <laughs> and then he'll, he'll, he'll say that uh, he doesn't want to be required to participate in worship services. He doesn't want to have to go to, to Bible classes and other religious rituals. Yes. He used the word rituals. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus Christ organized? Was he? Was, he, was his religion an organized religion? <clears throat> Isn't it true that Jesus Christ himself observed the Passover feast with his disciples? Right. Look over at Matthew 26, chapter verse 17, and the verses which follow. Okay, he was eating that, that Passover feast with his disciples. He was a good Jew. He observed right. Jewish tradition. Amen. And Jesus Christ, is it true that he was well versed in the law of Moses? Is it true? Are you familiar with Jesus' statements? In Matthew the 16th chapter, verse 18, where he said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. If he built his church, then that church is an organization, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't a church an organization? It's not just a building of brick and mortar. It's people, and right. people who work together who are in a unit. Right. And furthermore, let me ask you this. Does the New Testament authorize ministers and leaders and church officials? Well, sure it does. Get from Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 12. We're, talk, so we're talking to a, a person right now who says they're against organized religion. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 11 through 12. So the Ephesian letter was written uh, by Paul to the church at Ephesus there. Okay? And in verse 11, what does he say? Read. And he gave some apostles. So he gave some apostles. And some prophets. And some prophets. And some evangelists. And some evangelists. And some Read. pastors and teachers. So pastors and teachers. All of these had a part, evidently. All these, these, these positions and these duties and responsibilities were involved. Okay? And for what reason? Read. For the perfecting of the saints. Ah, to perfect the saints. For the working of the ministry. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. There you have it. Mm -hmm. You cannot perfect the ministry without having people doing these tasks. Right. Okay? You cannot edify the body without having people in these slots doing these responsibilities. And that's organization. Yeah. And that's Jesus' organization. Okay? He, he's the one that gave the information to the apostles who then gave it to the early church and set it all in motion. Why did Jesus choose 12 apostles if he didn't like to have organization? Why did he teach and train them throughout his ministry for three years? on this earth. Why then did Jesus Christ give the apostles his commandments to go into all the world and teach all nations, right. baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit? Amen. Why? <laughs> and those apostles, okay, did they, did they break the system? Were they, were they uh, uncomfortable with organization? No, they weren't. They did exactly what Jesus asked them to do. Amen. Which of the apostles said, no, Lord, I want to do my own thing. <laughs> Which apostle was resistant to the concept of evangelizing? You tell me. Did any of them protest that it sounded too much like organized religion? Did they? Did any of them say, Lord, we don't have time for all that? No, they went to work immediately, and we must do the same thing also. Didn't the early church meet on a regular basis? Those of us who are studying right now in the Sunday morning Bible class, we're studying the book of Acts right now, which is the blueprint for the church. And we're in the 20th chapter of Acts. Acts 20 verse 7 says, upon the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Right? 
they came together on a, on a regular basis. What day? And not Saturday, and not Friday. It was the first day of the week, which we call Sunday. Amen. Didn't the early church engage in organized worship? You don't believe it? Look at Acts, the second chapter, verse 42. Look at that. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What they do? In, in fellowship, right. breaking of bread, and in prayers. Right. Now, in my book, that's worship. <laughs> I don't know how you see it. That's worship. And they, 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 and they did it on a regular basis from the very beginning, because the church began recorded there in Acts, the second chapter. Mm -hmm. What about these things? It's wrong. What about these things that you call rituals? Aren't these acts of worship? What about, what about these things uh, are, are, are so offensive to you? Shouldn't we engage in these acts of worship? What about the communion? Isn't that important? That's a ritual, it's a memorial. It's extremely important. Because Jesus Christ himself instituted it. Matthew the 26th chapter. We see it at, the, at the, the, the Passover feast with his apostles, Jesus Christ told them, from now on, this bread represents my body. And this cup, this fruit of mine, represents my blood for you. And often as you eat and drink this, you do it in remembrance of me. And I want you to do it in remembrance of me. It was meant to be a perpetual thing. That's a ritual, and that's oration, and that's right, and that's Bible. You cannot claim to be a Christian, you cannot follow these type of things. Is it true that God has been directing man what to do and how to do it for, for centuries? For a long, long time. You know, all the way back to, to the Old Testament, he, he instructed Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He gave guidance to, to, to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. Didn't Jesus Christ even tell us how to conduct ourselves? What our attitude should be like? Yeah. Matthew the fifth chapter, verses one through forty-eight. The be attitudes yeah. said, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Yeah. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." He told us how to act, how to conduct ourselves around people and our humanity. Yeah. That's organization. How then can you tell me that you're against organization? You know what? This witness is an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I can't work with it anymore. <laughs> my, second, my second witness, I call defendant number two. This person says that she claims to be a Christian, but she said that one church is as good as another. <laughs> Have you heard that? Yes, sir. One church is as good as another. My, my first thought is, where, where did you get that from? <laughs> but I asked her, I'll ask some questions to her. I ask her, what church do you attend? Okay, and let's say uh, she'll say something like, well, I, I used to go to the Wesleyan Church, but now I go to the Smooth River Peaceful Valley Church. <laughs> uh, could you repeat that, please, for the court to get that? Smooth River Peaceful Valley Church. And then ask her, why is your church called by that name? And her answer is, I don't know. Probably so it can attract people. It's creative. It's inspirational. It's beautiful. Really, I said, really. You know what, I'm gonna come back to that question a little bit later on. Now let me ask you this, how often do you worship at the Smooth River Peaceful Valley Church? She said, well, uh, I go about two or three times a month. Two or three times, that's all. You don't go every week? She said, no, <clears throat> no. I have other things uh, going on, but I try to get there when I can, okay? Well, let me ask you this, how long do you spend in worship service when you do go? She says, oh, about an hour, an hour and a half. Okay, so it is your testimony that you go to church two or three times a month and you spend an hour and a half in church when you go. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, she said. I, I, like, I like that church, she said, because I can go early and get out early. <laughs> and I can, I, can, I can get out and have the rest of the day to myself. I didn't ask her, uh, is getting out quickly and early important to you? She said, yes, yes it is. I have other things to do. Okay, and so my question is, are the other things you have to do more important than worshiping? She said, well, I'm not saying that they're more important than worship, but, but they are important. Mm -hmm. okay. Like what, I say, Brother Sterling? <laughs> like what? Well, she said, I uh, uh, start stammering a little bit, start mumbling. I remind you you're under oath, <laughs> and you're sworn to tell the truth. 
She said, well, you know what? I, I can't think of any specifics right now, but they are important things, trust me. Okay, good. Uh, do you have an evening service at your church, at the Smooth River Pico Valley Church? She says, uh, evening service? What's that? I said, never mind. Which one? Which one? Ask and answer. I then said to her, okay, uh, do you have you have Bible study at your church? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we do. Do you believe in the Bible? Yes, I do. I then asked her, do you bring your Bible to church and worship services? She said, well, I do sometimes. Okay. Do you study your Bible at home? She says, uh, but yes, I do. Okay. How often do you study your Bible at home? So she says, well, I, I, you're under oath. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I, I'm not sure exactly, but I do study my Bible at home. Okay. Uh, well, who has seen you studying your Bible at home? Any witnesses? Well, do you live with other people? Well, I got some roommates. Okay, you got your roommates. Good. <laughs> have your roommates seen you study the Bible? I'm sure they have. That's her answer. If I brought your roommate in here right now and put your roommate on the stand, <laughs> would your roommate say that she sees you studying your Bible on a regular basis? She said, you know what? Uh, these questions sound very personal. <laughs> <laughs> they are personal. I'm talking to you. <laughs> they are personal. It's your testimony that you go to church two or three times a month and you're at church an hour and a half during the day, you get in to get out early, and when you get home, if you get a chance during the week, you might study, but no one has seen you do any study. Is that what you're saying? She said, no, it's not like that. You make it sound so bad. <laughs> Maybe it does. Maybe it does sound bad. Let me ask you, who is the head of your church? She says, uh, let's see, uh, the Reverend Dr. Casey Masterson. <laughs> he's the head of the church? Yeah, yeah, he's the head of the church. He, he's sharp, too. He, he, he's funny, he's very smart. What about Jesus Christ? What about Jesus Christ? I don't understand the question. You see, when I ask who is the head of the church, you should have been able to say, Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. But he is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Amen. He gave his life for the church. Right. He purchased it with his own blood. How can you be a Christian and not know that and not understand that? When you say one church is as good as another, it indicates that you have a lack of knowledge about the church itself. That's the problem. You don't understand that Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church. If he built his church, then Reverend Masterson does not have a church. Mm -hmm. Reverend Masterson is just working at that particular church. Mm -hmm. Don't you see that? Mm -hmm. See, there is only one church. And this one church is based upon the one body. One spirit, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And it's based on one God and Father who is above all and who's in us all, right? right. Ephesians 4, verse 4 to 5. And that's what we need to understand today in the 21st century. Because they understood that way back then. You, if you go all the way back to the first century and ask someone, are you a member of the church? They will not say to you, which one? <laughs> there was only one church. Amen. We need to get back to that again, Amen. church. We need to get back to the one church, that Jerusalem church, that New Testament church, Amen. and follow it all the way into eternity. Yeah. Did Peter and James tell Jesus they want to shop around a little bit and see what other churches were teaching? <laughs> what do you mean when you say that one church isn't good enough? Don't you mean that the Lutherans are as good as the, as the Methodists and they're as good as the Baptists and all others? Well, that may be true, you know. There's a lot of good people in those groups. And they're, you know, they're sincere people and they're, you know, and they're, they're doing what they think is right. But sometimes people can be sincerely wrong. True. You must show the difference between truth and error. And there is a difference between the two. You must follow the teaching of the scripture. But what if these churches what all these good people who are sincere, what if they're not teaching what Jesus commanded? What if they're teaching the, uh, their own ideas? What if they're ignoring biblical principles and developing their own principles? What if they're moving in different directions and moving away from the church? What then? Is one church still as good as another? Well, she said, well, I mean, they're all the same. They may be all the same, but are they all correct? That's the question. If they're all the same, why do they not wear the same name? Why not? If the church belongs to Jesus, why not wear his name? Amen. In the scripture, we see that the church referred to as the church. It's referred to the churches of Christ collectively. Okay? It's referred to the church of the living God, referring to Jesus, who purchased it with his own blood. Amen. The church is all referred to as, as Jesus' church. 
right. he built it. Right. Therefore, it should wear his name. He should be somewhere in the naming of that church. Yes. We should be naming our church as a river and valley and mountain and good people. <laughs> no, I didn't ask her. I didn't ask her. Look, why do these churches teach different doctrines? Why do they accept? Why do they not accept the Bible and use it only? Why all these other things? Isn't it true that many churches love to use creed books? Many churches love to use authors. There are some churches where people can quote popular authors better than they can quote the scriptures. Can you imagine that? There are some places where people give more credence to Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Rick Warren, Creflo Dollar, or what I call them counterfeit dollar. <laughs> and all these other people who are out there uh, uh, in the media who are teaching the multiply thousands of other people. People often abandon the principle of the church and fall out to these people because they're charismatic and they're exciting, but we have left the word. Uh -huh. yeah. If I have you on trial today, you must, you must tell the truth. We must get back to basics again. And the truth has to do with the practices of the early church, the teachings of the early church, the communion of the early church, the baptism of the early church, and the conversion of the early church. Amen. Yeah. Witness your excuse. <laughs> I can't win with her. I can't. <laughs> My next witness, I call defendant number three. This person claims to be a Christian. He talks about being a Christian. He talks a good game. Ever been anyone like that before? Yes, they, they can talk that talk, right? They have the, the clever catchphrases. You know, how are you doing today? I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a child of God, and you know me, I know him. They, God, they, 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 can, they can turn a phrase really good. You got to name it and claim it. You got to name it and claim it. What does that mean? It tells people, you know, whatever you want, just, just pray for it, and it's going to happen to you. Now, the Bible is not teaching quite that way, does it? But there are people who, they go around stopping these things all the time. I'm not perfect. I'm just blessed. God is good. He's good all the time. Yeah. They can turn all these phrases. And these phrases might be true in some way or another. But be able to turn a phrase or coin a phrase, that does not help a person learn what to do to be pleasing to God. As a matter of fact, if you say it too much, it's vanity. You repeat it all the time, it's vain. Vain repetitions. Well, and what did Jesus say about vain repetition? Yeah. Look over at Max, Matthew the sixth chapter, verse seven. He was talking to the Pharisees who were praying the same thing all the time. And Jesus said to them, "But when you pray, use not vain repetitions yep. as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking." Yeah. If you're doing things to be to impress man, to impress woman, or other people, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You, you coin those phrases. You put them on your, on your car license plate. You do it for the wrong reason. It's got to be in here, people. Amen. It's got to be internal. You have to really internalize the gospel and live it and breathe it and, and, let, it, and let it exude from, from your personality and from your, from your being and your communication. That's what's pleasing to God. Is it not true that the church is based upon God's divine plan for mankind? Is it not true that Jesus' commandments through the apostles and disciples helped to guide the church? Is it also true that the apostles instructed the church members and the early church servants are examples? Isn't that where we should go? Rather than coining clever phrases and impressing other people? You know, uh, that's the problem with the world today. The problem with the world. I'm excusing that person too. I can't work with that person either. <laughs> Another way to say, you know what? Uh, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Uh, but I give, I give money to the homeless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when I see them, you know, I, 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 I pray that I say God bless you to the homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, I love my fellow man. I was raised Catholic, but I don't practice it anymore. Uh, so my question to that person is, well, what do you practice mm -hmm. right now? If you don't practice that anymore. And uh, what do you believe? And how do you demonstrate what you believe? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, get for me, uh, Brother Sturgeon, Matthew, the sixth chapter, yes, verse one through six. Yes, Matthew yes. six, verse one through six. Sometimes people, sometimes people, you know, they, they convince themselves that what they're doing is right and it's good. Mm -hmm. And especially they get a couple of attaboys. Mm -hmm. You know what an attaboy is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing a good job today. Atta boy! Atta boy. All right, there you go, there you go. You get that point. Yeah. Sometimes people, they, they want that more than they want 
God's blessing. Or do pleasing unto God. What does Matthew 6, verse 1 through 6 say? Take heed. Take heed. That you do not that you do not your alms before men. Okay, now alms are, are offerings of money that, that, that people give into the treasury. Read. To be seen of them. Yeah, don't do it to be seen of men. When you're giving your alms, don't do it to be seen of men. But what? Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Okay, you won't get any reward from God. You get an boy. Okay, but if you're, doing, if you're doing it just to be, to be seen by men, you won't get God's reward. Read. Therefore, when thou dost some, do, when thou doest thine alms, okay, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as okay. the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Don't make that noise. Read. And in the streets. All right, read. That they have glory of men. See, that's what people want. They want the glory of men. They want the glory. They want to be seen by other people. Read. Verily I say unto you. I say unto you. They have their reward. You're gonna get the reward. If you if you want men to see you, you gotta get the reward. You hold twenty dollars. I'm putting twenty dollars in the collection plate right now, and somebody in the back there was gonna say, "Ah, boy, <laughs> you got your reward, okay?" But that's not what the Lord is looking for. Read. But when thou doest alms, when you give your alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand hath done. Do it. Okay. Read. That thine alms may be in secret. It should be a private matter. Be private. You decide how much you're gonna give. You don't have to brag to other people, show them thing. You decide how you're gonna do it. Right. Read. And thy father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. See, God can see that. God sees the heart. Amen. And he sees what you do. He will reward you. Read. And when thou prayest, when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. Don't be as like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street. Right, read. That they may be seen of men. See the men. Verily I say unto you, mm -hmm. they have their reward. Right. People who, who like to be seen in men, they want to look like they're being very, very religious, you know, and they're being very generous. And yeah, they, they do like to be seen giving money to the poor, you know, and maybe looking very religious. But that's not the key, is it? Read. But thou, you, when thou prayest, when you pray, go enter in thy closet. Go in the closet. Go in the private place. Read. And when thou hast shut thy door, shut that door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, yes, and as thy father, which is seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Yeah, make it a private, personal thing. Don't try to pray for show. And now we're not talking about leading in prayer in a worship service. We're talking about people who are trying to do things in a showy fashion so they can look uh, religious and will look pious to other people. Okay? And when I pray, pray you know, for a long time, out in public somewhere, or when they give a whole lot of money. You know, there are a lot of people who are philanthropists. They give, but that's not making them a Christian, does it? No. They give millions of dollars, but they don't even go to church or even believe in God. Okay, so you know better than they are. You got to do things that God is pleased with. You got to do it His way Amen. and with Him. And that's what we're looking at today. Yes, okay? A Christian on trial must be able to substantiate their Christianity. Now, I have a lot of Church of Christ members here, to be honest. I know that. And you're probably thinking to yourself, Brother David, that's not me. Those are the other people that you're talking about. That's not me. Well, let's, let's bring our home a little closer, okay? Let's talk to our next defendant who is a Church of Christ member. Yeah, that's right. Church of Christ member. Now, I put you on the stand. And I'm going to ask you a few questions. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am a Christian. Okay? <laughs> How do I know you're a Christian? Well, you say, well, you know what? I go to church every Sunday. Okay. You say, I don't curse. You say, I only drink wine at home and champagne at weddings. Okay. I'm not giving it much wine. And you say, well, I give $50 in contribution every week. And I listen to the preacher's sermon. Okay. People see me coming to church all the time. That's how I know I'm a Christian. All right. I feel good about that, right? <laughs> well, no, all those things might be true. Okay? But my Christian friends, don't be smug or pious about those things. You gotta really look look within yourself and see if you're following what the scriptures require for you to follow. It. The outward signs, they, they may look good. But let's go a little bit deeper. Go beneath the, the go beneath the the the, uh, the surface or peel back the layers of the onions of your life. Let's take a look at it. Let's talk about your attendance for a minute, okay? Your testimony today is that you attend uh, church every Sunday, correct? Okay. Yeah, is that Sunday morning or Sunday evening? No, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> Isn't it true that your congregation has Bible classes on Sunday morning before worship services and on Wednesday evening? Isn't it true that your congregation uh, 
Your congregation uh, invites every member to come at those times also? Yes, sir. Okay, so refresh my memory again. Uh, when do you come to, and study the Bible? Well, I can't make it to those. So, okay, are you studying at home then? Are you studying at home? Can anyone see you? Can anyone verify that? <laughs> well, God knows. Yeah, God knows. God knows a lot of things. Be, be careful. He said, say God knows. Yes, that God knows when, when you're telling a, a mistruth. <laughs> okay? I didn't say lies. See, I said a mistruth. Well, I tell the judge, you know, you know, my client has been less, less than straightforward. <laughs> it's forthcoming with the statement. <laughs> okay? People, you have to be able to look at what you're really doing, right? Doesn't Hebrews 10:25 admonish us to forsake and not be silly of ourselves together? Right? Think about it. You who are Christians, who you know you're a Christian, have you been forsaking the assembly? Do you not go to church when, when you have something else that, that comes up as more important to you? Do you do you not think twice about it? You're out of here uh, at, at the ball game. Your friend has something to do. Uh, somebody came over to the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Someone came over to the house. Now a lot of Christians. Members of the church have told me I couldn't make it to the service because someone came over to the house. Uh -huh. People, <laughs> what difference does it make if someone came to the house on the Lord's day? Amen. It's the Lord's day. Amen. I can remember as a, as a boy growing up, living in West Virginia, Torn Park Avenue, Brother Stevenson. Yeah. We had relatives that came from Texas, came to our house on a Sunday morning, came to the house, and we were getting dressed for church. And we said, Daddy, you know, come and JT and they're here. You yeah. know, that's fine. Come on in, come in. Then JT, you gotta have a seat here, the refrigerator right here. Again, give us a light. We're going to service. <laughs> <laughs> we left them right there at the house. Then I said, well, we came from Texas. I don't care where you came from. It's the Lord's day. You can stay right here, but you're gonna go back to Texas. We <laughs> came where you came. You know what they did. <laughs> And then we had a good period of fellowship with them. But we did not forsake the assembly because villagers came out of town. What about you? What about you? Well. Forsake not the assembly of yourself. People, there are reasons for, for missing service. I know that. All I'm saying is you have to examine your reasons Amen. and see if they pass muster. And, and many of the reasons that I have heard in my long association with the Church of Christ, those, those reasons don't pass muster. Okay? But between you and God, though, not between you and David, David Lewis, between you and God. Okay? You have to be able to study and be able to demonstrate you have studied. Amen. You can tell me you study all day long. Yeah. I might believe it, I might not. Okay? But God knows if you right. study. That's right. If you study. And why should you study? Why? Because that's how we equip ourselves to do God's will. Second right. Timothy 2.15 says, study. To show yourself a proof unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. No. You must be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Otherwise, you will get led astray by people who are teaching all matter of doctors out there today. No. So my question to you is how many, how many hours a week do you spend in church? How many hours a week do you spend uh, in Bible study, in reading the Bible, trying to find out what God wants you to do? Now, do you know how many hours in a week? Yep. What about math people here? Uh, 168. That's how many hours in a week. Right. <laughs> if you come to Bible class on Wednesday and, and Sunday morning, that's two hours. Yep. Two hours out of 168. But see, I can't do that math. But I know that's not 10%, I know it's not 5%. You can getting way, way down there. Okay? That is a, a, a small percent of time. You spend more time eating breakfast during the week, you do study. You spend more time driving in your car than you do study. More time watching cable TV than study. Okay? Reading your magazine than studying the Bible. Okay? Somehow we have to balance this thing out here. Put your priority in, in order, church. I'm talking to everyone here who claims they're a Christian. You're on trial today. How many hours are you putting in the Lord's Word? What is the proof? I want to see the proof. What was the evidence? Okay? Can anybody substantiate what you're saying? Anyone seen you? Anyone know about it? Well, my wife said, no, your wife. <laughs> your wife loves you, and she cannot be compelled to testify against you. <laughs> I accept your wife's statement. <laughs> what about other people? What about someone who, who's not worried about, about offending you? And then you mentioned socializing. Okay, a little bit of wine and a little bit of champagne. You know what? Let's look at all the socializing that people do. Okay? All the things that people do to socialize. Party. Wild party. Dancing. Lustful and inappropriate behavior. You know what I'm talking about. I don't mean ballroom dancing. 
I don't mean husband and wife dancing, but something other things that people do that, that, uh, that we see out there. And that some of you see when you go to those places that you go to. <laughs> I'm not going to be in the places because, you know, I haven't been there. <laughs> you know where the places are. Okay? They're, 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 part, they're part of the CLUB establishment. <laughs> That's a club, David. <laughs> That's where people are going and they're claiming Christianity today. Do you make inappropriate choices with your entertainment. What about that? Do you enjoy watching filthy movies, reading filthy literature? Do you enjoy the graphic sexual scenes that we see now on a lot of our programs, which have no bearing to the storyline, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with it. The storyline is about you're landing on Mars, and all of a sudden there people are in bed. How do you go from Mars to bed? I don't get that. Who wrote that one, you know? <laughs> That's got into the, the public buying into, and sadly, Christians are buying into it also. Why is that? You testify, and you give fifty dollars a week. That's good. That's good. Now that would be two hundred dollars a month. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, but the scriptures teach us that we make make our offering on a regular basis, and we should decide to, to give by spiritual means and spiritual methods. Yeah. How much should a person give? We're not going to be able to tell you that. It's up to you and your God. But the Bible gives us some guidelines about giving. Some guidelines in the Old Testament. Jacob, when he realized all that God had done for him Amen. and protected him and brought him a mighty long way, yeah. Jacob said, I am going to vow a vow yeah. that from now on, the Lord will protect me and guide me as he has always done. I will give a tenth of everything I have to the Lord. Amen. He vowed a vow, and from then on, that became known as the tithes. 10% of everything, money, property, animals, everything he had. 10%. Now, it follows through throughout the, 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 the Old Testament, and throughout the uh, law, law of Moses and the Levitical law, they gave 10%. Here we are now in the New Testament. We have so much more that God has given us, so much more blessings, so much opportunity. Jesus Christ himself has been given to us. What does the New Testament teach us about giving? Well, tell, tell us a couple of things. First of all, we should give as God has prospered us. Amen. First Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. As God has prospered us. Is that $50 a week? I don't know. You tell me. You know how much you earn. Mm -hmm. You know how much God has prospered you. Yeah, and, and giving by the, the kind of car that I see in the parking lot out here. And some of the homes I've seen, I'm pretty sure you've been prospered more than $50 a week. <laughs> I can tell that already. Give from the heart. Yeah, we should, we should purpose in our heart. Purpose means to decide, decide or to plan ahead. Okay? Second Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, where, where we, we see the Apostle Paul saying, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully will reap bountifully. What does that mean? Okay? You get out of something what you put into it. Okay? If you put into the church or the church work things that, that, are, that, that are monumental, you get more things out. Yes, sir. Okay? If yes. you put in the leftovers, you get leftovers. <laughs> you can hardly anything. Okay? What's that, what's that little analogy about the story always uses? What I said, said, don't come here to the, the collection table and say, let me see what kind of chain they got in the pocket here. <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever's in here, we'll, we'll go in, into the, uh, the plate. That shows that you're not purposing. You didn't plan. Okay? You're not, you're not doing like Jacob did. He might you're not doing like Paul recommended in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. You have to, to decide what you will give back to the church. Right. And the church needs money. We need money so we can carry on the work of the church. Money so we can pay the bills, take care of our expenses, to finance our ministries, our staff. You know, the Lord has blessed us with so much here. So much we able to do. But it takes finances to keep these things going on. And the church members must give those finances. Okay? Paul writes. You know, that we have to have the right spirit. And then we're reminded by the words of Jesus Christ as, as Paul spoke on it in Acts 20, chapter, verse 35. I have showed you all things, how they're so laboring up to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. Amen. Jesus' own words. If you give and you have a giving heart, you will be rewarded for that. You'll be blessed for that. We who are living in the Christian age should be able to do better than those in the Mosaic age, the Old Testament. They gave 10 percent. What percentage of your income are you giving? Is your giving purposed? Is it consistent? Is it sacrificial? 
Jesus was impressed by the widow who only gave two mites. Why? That it was sacrificial. She gave all she had it. She gave all her living. Luke 21, verse 2. I won't read it for you right now, but you know the story of that. Get for me Matthew 7, verse 24 through 28. Yeah, now this is the, the, the uh, these are verses that come right after, right after the, the scripture that was read in our text. And Jesus Christ is still talking here. Matthew 7, 24 through 28. Therefore, therefore, whatsoever heareth these sayings of mine. Okay, whosoever hears the saying of mine, and this is Jesus Christ talking. Go ahead. And doeth them. And he doeth them. I will liken them unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Okay, now if you hear Jesus saying, and you do them, you're a wise man. Read. And the rain descended. So he's using the metaphor now. You build a house on a rock, the rains come down. And the floods came. The floods came up. And the winds blew. Winds are blowing. And beat upon the house. Beat all over the house. And it fell not. Stood right there. Amen. For the it was founded right upon a rock. It was founded on a rock. We found another one. But then what else? Read. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and when they hear these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, if you don't do them, shall be likened unto a foolish man. Be like a foolish man. Which builds his house upon sand. So your house upon the sand. And the rains descends. Rains come. And the floods came. Floods. And the winds blew. Winds. And beat upon the house. Beat upon the house. And it fell. Of course it's gonna fall. And great was the fall of it. It's on sand, people. You can't do it on sand. You can't hardly walk on sand. You can slip and slide over the place, right? Imagine having a house on that foundation. That's what you like if you hear the words of Jesus and you do not do them. Are you a Christian today? Yes, I am. Do you do Jesus Christ's words? Do you follow his commandments? Do you follow his instructions? You live a, a life that he has authorized us to live under the umbrella of Christianity today. That's what you must ask yourself. Jesus Christ gave us commands. He spoke not as one of the scribes, but as one having authority. Right. Matthew 7, verse 29. That's why they had to listen to what he said. Yeah. It is not, it, it, see, Jesus Christ, when, he, when he's made statements, for example, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's a rock bottom statement. Mm -hmm. You don't change that. You don't say to people, baptism is no longer essential for salvation. You cannot change that. No, because Jesus Christ said it. Jesus Christ said, he, you must come to me. You must repent of your sins. You can't change that. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell to not be You can't change that. Yeah. Jesus, you must live a certain kind of life. And if you want to go into the kingdom of heaven, you can't change that. Because he has said it. Yes, sir. And it must be followed. Amen. It is not our place to come along now and teach things that are not in the scriptures. And that Jesus Christ did not teach. Yeah. Here are my parting thoughts right now. If you're a Christian today, where is the evidence? Where is it? What is your pattern? What can you testify to on your behalf? Who else can testify for you who has seen these things that you have done? How productive are you? Who are you working with? If you're a Christian today, what is distinguishing you from thousands and thousands of people who are out there pretending to be Christians? Or thousands of people who believe? I'm not, I'm not uh, besmirching people who, who believe in Jesus Christ, and there are a lot of believers out there. But when you say you're a Christian, that's going to mean something. Right. Christian means you're part of Christ. Amen. If you're part of Christ, that means you have a connection with Christ. You're doing His will and doing it His way. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, if we go back to our text in Matthew 7, chapter, verse 21, that is a sad, sad account. Because Jesus said there will be many religious people who are going to come to Him on Judgment Day. And they're going to report to him all the great things that they have done. All the things that they think are, are fantastic and spiritual. All right. But the problem is, the problem is that they did things that they wanted to do. They did things that they thought were good. They did things that were not part of Jesus' commands or instructions or his will. And therefore, he tells them, depart from me. You that work iniquity. Iniquity here means you did it without authority. Yeah. You did it without my command. You did it your way. You cannot do it your way. Mm -hmm. What about you, my Christian friend? What about you today? Are you doing things which you think will impress Jesus Christ? That he will not be impressed. <clears throat> Are you doing things that will convince him that, you, that your way is just as good as his way? It is not. 
What about you today? Are you really doing church work today? Or are you just showing up to build up false spiritual capital? Man. What about you today? Hmm. Coming to the church service is good, but it's not church work. Coming to a fellowship uh, meeting is not good. I mean, it's good, but it's not church work. Yeah. It builds our bonds. It helps us to relate to each other better. That's not church work. Church work, when you get out there in the world, you share that gospel. Try to bring people in, try to enlighten people. You try to serve humanity. You make people's lives better. You follow the biblical example and follow the example of Jesus Christ. It's better to give than to receive. That's church work. Church work is not coming and showing up at a church picnic. That's a lot of fun. I love those picnics. That's not church work. Okay? It doesn't matter how many events you come to. And you can get Brother Fletcher up here on the stand. He said he saw you, he saw you in every single play, at every picnic. That's not church work. You must do the work of the church. Amen. It starts with Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. That's where it starts. And from then on, you got to keep on living the life. Yes, sir. Our church model this year. What time is it? It's time to do more. Amen. That's our model for the whole year. Amen. What time is it? It's time for us to do more. More means being more productive, being more effective. And then you can truly earn the name that you wear, a Christian. You know, we, we, we look at our text and we see that there are many, many people who think they're doing the Lord's will. Okay? But they, they satisfy their own consciousness and not the Lord. They move in and out of church with no real level of commitment. That's the problem in the religious world. That's the problem in the church today. Look at what, what the, the Bible writers said. The apostle Peter said that we must grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's 2 Peter 3.18. Paul said we must preach the gospel for it is the power of God. Romans 1.16. The early church risked their lives every day for the cause of Christ and made them die. Look over at Acts the, the sixth and seventh chapter. God expects us to fear him and keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. For this is a whole duty of man. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the son hath made you free. You are free indeed. Amen. Amen. Okay? Those are words we must live by. Those are words we must, we must make sure that we internalize. And then and Jesus finally said, you shall know each other by the fruit that you bear. Yes, right. If a tree bears good fruit, you keep it around. If it does not bear good fruit, you hack it up. You, know, you put it in the wood chipper. It's got to go. What about you, Christian? What about you? In conclusion, saying that you are a Christian does not make you a Christian. There must be some evidence to support that claim. You must do something. You must demonstrate it. It must be more than coming to church services when it's convenient. More than paying a few dollars in the collection plate. More than paying lip service to Christianity today. Any two-bit shyster can cut you up apart if you can understand but that kind of evidence. And I'm not saying I'm a two-bit shyster. <laughs> I'm just saying anyone could with the kind of evidence that you're presenting today if you don't have more to substantiate your claim. But what should be of more concern to you is if you cannot fool mankind, how, how can you fool God? And the Lord Jesus Christ if you want God to bless you and give you the things you need and want all this life, you gotta prove yourself. Prove yourself worthy of those blessings. Not only for the benefits in this life and the blessings in this life, but in the life to come. To be a Christian, you must do what the Lord says do. You must do it sincerely. You must do it His way and not your own. And not the popular way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, I'm not a plumber. I'm not a plumber at all. I see plumbers all the time. I cannot go to your house and tell you I will fix your plumbing problem. You know, I'm not going to get in there and start tinkering around with, 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 the, with the pipes, you know, start moving things around a little bit. I'll make it a lot worse. You know why? Because I'm not a plumber. I don't have plumber training. I don't have plumber skills. You know, I have the background. I have the know-how. Okay? I never work with it. I could probably be a plumber if I worked at it, but I'm not one. It is the same thing for those of you who claiming that you're a Christian and you're not. You have to acquire the skills, the knowledge, and the attributes of a Christian in order to profess Christianity. You must invest your time, energy, efforts, money, and resources into this Christian world. And that, my friend, that will be your proof. 
Let me approve. Let others see your Christianity at, at, at work. You don't have to shout it off from the rooftops. You don't have to wear a sign around you. You know, a crazy hat with, with Christ on it. It will be evident that you will exude Christianity from your very being. You'll be involved in church work. And, and, and you will share your faith with others. It will come natural to you because you'll work on it every day. And eventually, eventually you are going to lead somebody to Christ. Amen. Somebody is going to go to the water and give a baptism because of your efforts one day. And that's a good feeling, church. And anybody who's ever converted to someone, that's how it's been done. When we start doing that and, and then more and more, then and only then can we unify the world under Christianity. And all of us will truly be Christians then. Amen. When that time comes, you got to be ready. There will come a time. There will come a time when you know, God, who made the whole world, will suddenly stop this world. And this world will stop spinning on its axis. Okay? And the air and the sun that we know of will be gone. And the sun will go down. One day, your eyes will close to open no more. That's One day, you take the last breath you ever breathe. Yes, One day, the curtain in your life will close and will not come up again. True. And the next thing you know, the next thing you know, you'll be whisked away into eternity. Mm -hmm. and you're going to find yourself standing for the judgment seat of God. Right. And when you get to that place, the Bible says there are going to be two books there. Yes, sir. Two books over. One book will be the Bible, the Word of God. Yeah. The other book will be the Book of Life. And everything you've done in this life is going to be in that book. You will be judged by Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, in that day. And at that time, you cannot get a reprieve. You cannot beg your way out. You can't pay your way out. And no one can pray you through. Because the scriptures do not teach that. Does not teach that at all. What you have to do then is you have to be ready for the judgment day. Be ready so that you can be delivered. Finally, Revelation 14, 13, I'm going to close with this, this verse. Jesus said, I mean John rather said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Yea, said the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Amen. Amen. The lesson is yours. There may be some people in the audience today who, you may not be a Christian. You came here today to engage in a worship service, and you find yourself on trial. You felt uncomfortable, you didn't like that. But you know what, you can leave today a Christian. You can be a Christian today, because you have the opportunity right now to obey the gospel. That's right, obey the gospel. In order to be a Christian, you must obey the gospel and do it God's way. We saw one person today who, who boldly stepped forward and put on the Lord in baptism. That's how it begins, right there. Amen. You must hear the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Believe the gospel. Believe that he came here to save mankind. Believe that he was sent here as part of God's divine plan. You must be willing to repent of your sins, to change your life, and to redirect your life in a different direction. You must be willing to confess your faith in Jesus Christ and Him to be the Son of God. You must be willing to be buried in water baptism right here. Let's go under the water. It's an act, a very simple act which demonstrates your willingness to obey. And then you come out of the water and give a baptism. You're a newborn creature. You've been born again. Yes. All things are, are, are new. All things have passed away. You are a new creature. And then you want to live your life according to the scriptures so that one day, one day, when this earthly veil has been pulled from you, you'll be ready to be called home with the Lord. Amen. That's how you become a Christian today. If you are a member of the church, you really are a member of the church, but you've fallen away, you've sinned, you've stumbled, you have not been a good example, you've been a horrible example, and you know it. Today is the day. You come on back to the Lord today. Repent of your sins, confess your faults one to another, let us pray with you and for you. We'll get you back on the right track. We're going to work with you. We love you. We care about you. Right. Okay? We're all in this together, all of us. One big family working together. You might need prayer. You might need the Lord to come and intervene in your life in some way. I don't know. You know what it is. But if you're subject to the invitation in any way, please come while together we stand and sing the invitation song. Hey, Somebody. Man.